right, so with that, I'd love to um, welcome Dr. Medeiros, um, who will tell us about uh, her work testing Einstein's theory of general relativity with images of black holes. So take it away, Leah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and play this. Okay, so hopefully you all can see the uh, purple swirly right there. So thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to speak with all of you today. I'm very excited to be here and get and have this opportunity. And today I'm gonna to be telling you about how we can use the Event Horizon Telescope to test Einstein's theory of gravity. And so before I move on from my title slide, I do wanna explain what it is that you are all looking at here. So this is the result of a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation, or GRMHD for short. And what that simulation does is that it self-consistently evolves the, uh, the flow of matter as it swirls around the black hole and as it falls into the black hole. So this simulation includes all of the effects of gravity on that matter. It also takes into account the fact that we have a a uh, magnetic field around this black hole and the, all of the matter swirling around the black hole is actually a plasma. So we have a bunch of charged particles that are moving through a magnetic field. And so those two things will interact in really exciting ways. And that is what causes magneto uh, hydrodynamic turbulence, which is what you're seeing here. And it's actually that turbulence that allows the matter to lose angular momentum so that it can actually fall into the black hole. In addition to all of that, we're also going to be taking into account essentially all of thermodynamics as well. And so we're keeping track of what's happening to the temperatures and the pressures of, of the flow as well. And so after we do that whole simulation of the flow, we also have to perform a second simulation on top of that, which in that simulation, we ask ourselves what would be happening to light. So specifically, would this matter be emitting light or absorbing light? And what wavelength of light would it be emitting or absorbing? We take all of that into account so that we can simulate the observational appearance of black holes at different wavelengths, which is what you're seeing here. So this is actually a free color image. The parts of the image that you see in blue um, are emission at 1.3 millimeter wavelength. The parts that are red uh, show emission at three millimeter wavelength. There is also green in here. It's kind of mixed with, with the blue and the red. And the green emission is wavelength of 0.87 millimeters. And so all three of those wavelengths together give you the image that you see here. And what we're gonna be talking about today is what I consider the gravitationally relevant feature in this image, which is this white ring that you see here that's very thin and remains constant while everything else is varying around it. So I'm gonna be defining that in great detail today. So for the first four or so slides of my talk, I'm gonna be talking at a pretty basic level just to make sure that everybody um, knows the basics so that we can get on to the more detailed and, and technical work at the end. So if you already know all of this stuff, just, just bear with me because I promise we'll get to, to more um, technical things later. So specifically what we're gonna be testing is the theory of general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. And I'm only gonna focus on a few specific properties of this theory that will be important for you to understand the rest of the talk. So specifically what you need to know is first that according to this theory, what happens is that mass curves space-time. So space-time is the four-dimensional space where we all live. There are three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. Why, that's why we call it space-time. And what happens is that mass curves space-time. And in turn, the curvature of space-time then tells mass how to move through that curved space. So I have a very overly simplified example here where I'm putting space and time in just two dimensions because I can't draw in four dimensions. And I'm gonna add a mass to this space time. And you can see how the mass will create this curvature in the space time. And so what's really, really gonna be important for this particular talk is what happens to light. 
So not only is matter going to move through this curved space time, but also light will be moving through this curved space time. And it's the curvature of the space time that will tell light how to move. And specifically what we're gonna be doing is we're going to use this fact to learn more about the curvature itself. By measuring how the light is affected, we can then learn more about how space time is curved. So I also have a overly simplified example here. These red uh, dashes here are photons and we're gonna see how adding a black hole to the space time is going to affect the trajectory of these photons. As you can see, some fall in, some escape, but m pretty much all of them have their trajectory affected in one way or another by this black hole. And so according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, as I just mentioned, light will be affected by gravity. However, according to Newtonian physics, that is not the case. According to Newtonian physics, light would not be affected by, uh, by the presence of gravity or presence of a mass. And so we can actually use this fact to test which of these two theories is correct. And so this is a diagram of, of the way in which we tested this for the very first time. And so there is a star that is uh, at this location, okay? And what we can do is we can measure the location of this star relative to other more distant stars when the earth is on the other side of the sun over here, okay? So when the sun is not between us and the star, we measure the location of that star. We may wait a few months so that now the sun is between us and this star. And then we do the same thing. We try to measure the position of that star relative to other more distant stars. And what happens is that the light from the star will follow this yellow path here. And so it will be deflected by the sun's gravitational field, specifically by the curvature due to the sun's presence. And that uh, deflection will allow the, the light to reach Earth. But when we receive the light from a astronomical object, we always assume that that light traveled in a straight line. And so the light's gonna be coming from that direction. And so we're going to assume that the star was in that direction. Okay, and what we can do is by comparing the position of the star relative to other more distant stars in these two different uh, times during the Earth's orbit, we will notice a small uh, apparent motion of that star relative to these other stars. And that's the apparent motion that is predicted if general relativity is correct. And so a little over a hundred years ago, this experiment was performed and it was the first time that this theory was tested. And so the image that you're seeing here is one of those original images from that very first experiment. What I think is really uh, impressive in this is that that experiment was done using photographic plates. So this image that you're seeing here is actually from photographic plates. I have added these white circles to, to kind of guide your eye a little bit because there are very small stars in each of these circles, but they are very hard to see. And what the researchers were able to do is literally use rulers to measure the locations of these stars and measure that they had moved. Of course, another important aspect of this experiment is that you had to wait for a total lunar, sorry, total solar eclipse where the moon is blocking the light from the sun so that you can actually collect the light from these small stars. Otherwise, the light from the sun would just completely overwhelm your photographic plate and you would not be able to observe these very small stars. And so when these results were published, this is the front page of the New York Times um, when these results were published. And it says, lights all askew in the heavens, Einstein theory triumphs. And this is what made Einstein so famous. So the reason I'm telling you about this experiment that was done over a hundred years ago is because we are still testing the same theory a hundred years later. And so the obvious question here is why, right? Why is it that we still have to test the same theory after a hundred years? Why is it that we haven't proven to ourselves and to the community that this theory is correct yet? So when we talk about testing gravity, it's really, really important to keep in mind that there are many different aspects of the theory that you can test. One way for you to think about this is that any particular theory might make a, a large number of predictions. And because you tested one prediction and that was correct, does not necessarily mean that all of the other predictions would also be correct. And if you find any discrepancy with any one of the predictions, then you know that there is something else that you do not yet understand about whatever 
fundamental process you're trying to understand. So in particular, in addition to just looking at the different aspects, we also need to take into account what regime we're dealing with. So in particular for gravity, when I talk about regime, what I'm talking about is the strength of gravity, right? So there, for this talk, there will be three examples. Um, and what I already talked to you about was the solar system example. So for the solar system, I'm going to consider that a medium strength of gravity, okay? So we have gravitating objects such as the sun that are quite massive compared to what we deal with here on earth, but compared to objects such as black holes, they're, they're not, uh, not extreme at all. And so another example of, of a regime where we have performed tests of of gravity is cosmology. So for those of us who are may, perhaps not astronomers, cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole. So this means that we're looking at really, really large scales. And that those really large scales, um, all of these small objects such as galaxies, um, planets, stars, black holes, all of these objects are so small at this really large scale that we can essentially ignore them. There are negligible perturbations to the overall curvature of the universe. And so on these scales, what we say is that we're at the extremely weak regime where the overall curvature of space time is very, very small. And it's really only recently where we were able to test the theory of gravity at the very uh, extreme regime of a strong gravitational field. And that was done with astrophysical black holes, first with the detection of gravitational waves, and also with the image of the black hole, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. And so I do want to get into a little bit more of the details about what I mean when I say different aspects. And so for us to do that, we're gonna to have to talk about a little bit more of the details of, of general relativity and specifically what general relativity predicts for black holes. So first we need to talk about what a metric is. A metric is just a word that we use um, to describe a specific equation within the theory of general relativity and any geometry in four dimensions will have a specific metric which will describe that geometry. That's really all you need to know for, for the purposes of this talk. And so what's really interesting is that if general relativity is correct, and if there are a few other assumptions that we think are very reasonable, if those other assumptions are also correct, then there is a theorem that states that there is only one solution for a black hole in space. Now, let me be very clear. There are several different solutions, but if you take into account the astrophysical, astrophysical constraints, then there is one solution that we believe should be the correct solution for astrophysical black holes. And that is the Kerr solution, or in other words, the Kerr metric. Okay, and this is a black hole that is spinning but does not have a charge. And the reason for that is that we don't expect astrophysical black holes to have charges because if they had a significant charge, they would just attract the opposite charge and become neutral. Okay, so we expect black holes to be Kerr. And so if we were to observe a astrophysical black hole that is not Kerr, then there has to be something fundamentally wrong in either our understanding of the theory of general relativity itself or in one of those other assumptions that I mentioned, okay? And so what we are doing with this image of this black hole is we're specifically testing the metric. And this is different from what is done, for example, with gravitational waves. And the reason for that is that our black hole, it is spinning, but we don't expect the spin to be changing as a function of time. And so it's only one metric. The metric isn't changing as a function of time. And if you compare that to, for example, gravitational wave sources, you might have two black holes spiraling around each other and they might coalesce. And in doing all of that, what happens is that the actual space time changes as a function of time. And so when you're dealing with these gravitational wave events, you need to deal with all of the metric parts, like you need to take into account the metric of each of these objects but you also need to take into account all of the dynamical components of the theory as well. However, for the EHT and for these black hole images, we are completely ignoring the dynamical aspects of the theory and we are only testing the metric. And that's because we're not sensitive to the dynamic part of the theory because the matter that is going around our black hole is really, really, really small compared to the mass of the black hole itself. 
So keep all of this in mind as I'm talking about these tests throughout the rest of the talk. And so in analogy to that very first test that I already talked about, what we're gonna be doing with the EHT is that we're also going to be using the fact that light will get affected by the curvature of space-time. And we're going to be using that fact to learn more about the curvature itself. And so the first time that somebody calculated what you would see if you were to look at a black hole was in the 1970s. And this figure here is from one of those original papers. And what they calculated is what you would see if you were to look at a black hole that was being illuminated by an infinitely large flashlight. And what they found is that you would see a bright ring that would encircle a dark region. And they called this dark region the black hole shadow. So obviously, since the 1970s, we've made a lot of advances and we have a much better understanding of what a black hole image should look like. And this is the same simulation that I showed you at the beginning. And so since this gravitationally relevant feature is called the black hole shadow, most people expect that it's going to be this dark region here in the center, but that's actually not the case. The edge of the black hole shadow is actually this uh, thin, uh, very bright white ring here that remains constant while everything else varies. And so the black hole shadow has a very precise mathematical definition, which I will get to shortly. But the overall idea of what we're doing is that if the black hole is a Kerr black hole, then we know the size and the shape that this black hole shadow should be. And so we're going to test whether or not it is consistent with those predictions. And so I do wanna highlight um, with this dashed circle here, the location of the black hole shadow in case it's hard to see over zoom as well. So, Let's get into a little bit more of the technical details of how we actually define the black hole shadow. So there are a few different ways to define this and I'm gonna give you two examples for this. I'm gonna start with the one that I think is the most intuitive. So in this uh, diagram here, the green circle is the event horizon and this dashed circle is the photon orbit. This is the radius at which it's possible for photons to orbit around your black hole. Your observer is going to be over here on the right at infinity. All of these red and blue lines here, these are photons, and we're going to evolve the trajectory of these photons as they move towards our black hole. So as you can see, all of the blue photons will fall into the black hole, all of the red photons will escape to infinity, and these blue photons are what creates the black hole shadow feature in the image. So the first thing that we notice is that the black hole shadow is significantly bigger than the event horizon. It's about two and a half times bigger than the event horizon. And so one, things that, one of the things that I always wanna be very clear about is that the event horizon telescope is named the event horizon telescope, but that's a bit of a misnomer because we are not actually observing the event horizon, we are observing the black hole shadow. And specifically the event horizon is actually not an observable feature. And at least so far, we have not been able to prove that this black hole actually has an event horizon. So it's important to keep all of that in mind. What we are doing is, is testing whether or not um, the black hole shadow is consistent with, with the predictions of Kerr. And so the simplest way for you to think about the black hole shadow is really just as an impact parameter. Uh, the radius of the black hole shadow is going to be the radius at which or the impact parameter at which um, it's the very edge between photons that fall in and photons that escape. So we call this the separatrix between photons that fall in and the photons that escape. Another way to think about this involves the photon orbit. So if you trace the trajectory of this photon here, that's right at the edge between photons that fall in and photons that escape, if you trace that backwards um, towards the back of the black hole here, you'll see that it is essentially tangent to the photon orbit. So another way for you to think about this feature is that it's the lensed photon orbit. And mathematically, you'll get the same answer either way. And so, the simulation that I just showed you in that diagram, that assumed that our black hole was not spinning. However, as I've already mentioned, we do expect that black holes in space will be spinning. So how does spin affect this? Specifically, how will spin affect the size and the shape of the black hole shadow? And so this blue circle here, this is the uh, edge of the black hole shadow for a non-spinning black hole. Just one second, I just need a, a drink of water. Sorry about that. So, so this is for a non-spinning black hole. And so you can see that it's a circle. 
and has a radius of about five in these units. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the spin of this black hole. And as I do that, the black hole spin axis will be pointing up and you will all be uh, observers at the equator of this black hole. So I'm going to go ahead and play that. We're going to see how spin will affect our black hole shadow. So as you can see, the black hole shadow is moving over to the right, but the size and the shape really hasn't changed that much. And it's only when you get to really high spin that you create this perturbation on the side here. And mathematically, if you were to define the asymmetry of this object, um, it's still really low asymmetry. This is still really close to a circle. And specifically, if you compare this to the error bar for the EHT, we would not be able to distinguish this shape from a circle, at least not right now. And so the shape, we will not be able to, to use the shape to measure the spin. What about the radius? So for all of the possible black hole shadows at every possible inclination and every possible spin, if you look at all of them and you measure the radii of all of them, you'll see that the radius is always between 4.8 and 5.2 gm over c squared, where m is the mass of the black hole. That is a variance of about 4%. So given the current error budget of the EHT, which I will explain shortly, there is no way that we can use the current EHT to test whether um, to, to measure the spin of this black hole. Specifically, we can't use the size and the shape of the black hole shadow to do that. So that is unfortunate if you're trying to measure spin. But what that means for the purposes of today's talk is that this is actually a really wonderful property because it means that we don't have any free parameters. So if we are measuring the radius of a black hole shadow for a black hole where we know the mass and we know the distance between us and the black hole, then there is only one specific prediction for that black hole shadow. And if it's anything different than that prediction, then we know that there's something we fundamentally don't understand either about gravity itself or about black holes. And so for those of you who are interested in the details of what's going on here, um, as you increase spin, you're increasing the effect of the quadrupole moment, and that would tend to make your shadow more oblate, and so it would be elongated horizontally. But as you increase spin, you're also increasing the frame dragging effect. And what that does is it's essentially going to shove your sh shadow back over to the right, and so it will get elongated in this direction, and then you're going to remove that part, and these two effects cancel out almost perfectly. Uh, for a Kerr black hole. And that really has to do with the symmetries of the Kerr metric, but that doesn't have to be the case in general. And so now that we've talked uh, extensively about what the black hole shadow is, we should also discuss what is necessary for the black hole shadow to be observable, because the black hole shadow is defined intrinsically uh, based on the geometry of the metric. And it um, is just a property of the metric, and it does not depend on any of the astrophysics and any of the matter that's going around it. But you do need to take into account the astrophysics to determine whether or not this feature will be actually observable. So there are three main things that you need to be able to observe this. So first, you need to have enough photons so that you can actually illuminate your black hole. Second, your emission needs to originate close enough to the black hole so that it will be strongly gravitationally lensed around the black hole. And third, the surrounding plasma has to be sufficiently transparent at the observed wavelength. So the animation at the top right here is going to build a little bit of intuition for this third point uh, about the plasma being uh, sufficiently transparent. So in astronomy, we call that optical depth. So you need to have um, the optical depth needs to be such that you can actually see through it. So this is also the, the result of a simulation similar to the other ones that I've shown you. But in this case, we are looking at the black hole, black hole almost edge on, whereas many of the others we were looking at it face on. And so the spin axis is pointing in this direction here. One of the things that's really, really important to keep in mind when we're talking about the EHT is that the two main sources that we want to observe, which are the black hole in the center of the galaxy M87, which is the black hole that you've already seen the image of, as well as the black hole in the center of our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star, both of the, those black holes are in a very specific regime of, the, of accretion physics. So they are what we call low luminosity sources. And that just means that the amount of matter that's falling into these black holes is really, really low compared to the overall distribution of matter falling into black holes. 
And what that means is that because you have such a small amount of mass falling in, um, this mass is actually not able to settle down into a thin disk. It still remains very hot because it is inefficient at radiating away that heat. And so because it remains hot, it remains very poofy. And so you should imagine these disks really as these big kind of torus, tori, I guess, of, of emission or in other words, a donut. And so this is why you see this kind of poofy flow here. This is your big poofy disk for this black hole. And so right now we're looking at emission that has a wavelength of one centimeter. And at one centimeter, we can see this big poofy flow. We can see these jet features, but we cannot see the black hole shadow. And so based on simulations, as well as a lot of analytic theoretical work, we were able to predict what wavelength the disk would be transparent for these two objects. And so in this animation, I'm going to go from one centimeter all the way down to 1.3 millimeters, which is the wavelength that we observe at. And we will see what happens to this disk. So as you can see, as you get a shorter wavelength, the disk becomes transparent. We're zooming in a little bit now, and you can see the black hole shadow, which the edge of the black hole shadow is this half circle that you see here that remains constant despite all of the other variability. Now, I know that it's a little bit hard to view the details in this particular color map. So I also included a, a second simulation here that I hope will be a, a little bit more uh, helpful. So here's a similar simulation, but again, we're looking at it face on. And I've also taken a horizontal and vertical cross sections of each of these images in the simulation. And the point here is that I want to look at the emission profile along this ring. And these dashed black vertical lines here, these are the analytically calculated edges of the black hole shadow. And so we're gonna compare the emission profile in these simulations to the edges of the black hole shadow. And this is a simulation where these three bullet points are met. And so as you can see, there is a lot of variability, but the feature of this peak of emission very close to the shadow, it's fairly constant despite the rest of the variability. And more importantly, if you were to uh, broaden this or smooth it, or in other words, if you were to convolve this with a Gaussian, which is essentially what the EHT does because it has low resolution, I mean, Low. It has the highest possible resolution, but these objects are really small. If you were to convolve it with a Gaussian beam, what you'll see is that you'll end up, um, this is actually a really good example, you'll end up with a Gaussian where the peak is relatively close to the edge of the black hole shadow. And so I'm going to be talking uh, in a bit more detail about the error budget, but just keep in mind as I am discussing that, that one of the things that we do is we use a large number of GRMHD simulations and we create uh, simulated data, including all of the observational noise uh, budgets and all of that. And then we put that simulated data through our full pipeline for the EHT to make these images. And so we are able to calibrate the ring size that is measured in the image with the location of the actual black hole shadow. And that potential error or any bias is taken into account into our error budget. So um, let's look a little bit more closely at what's really going on here. Why is it that the peak of the emission is close to the edge of the black hole shadow? Again, when those three bullet points are met. So in this diagram, the horizon is in red, the photon orbit is in blue, and this vertical line here is a photon. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send uh, several different packets of photons and I'm going to show how the lensing of these photons is going to change as you change the impact parameter of them relative to the black hole. In this case, your observer should be here at the bottom of your, of your screen at infinity. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that. I'm gonna let it play a couple times and then I'm gonna pause it to show you a, a couple different examples here. Okay, so these are the, the three different examples I wanna show you. So the way that you should be thinking about this simulation is as follows. At the observer's image plane, we can trace back the trajectory of each photon on the observer's image plane. And remember the time is symmetric here. So you can trace the photon backwards in time or forwards in time and you'll have the same trajectory. 
And so the point here is that when you trace this photon back from the observer's image plane back towards the black hole, you want to ask yourself whether these photons spent significant time in a region of the accretion flow that will have significant emission. And if the photon passed through a, a, a place in the accretion flow with a lot of emission, then we know that at that location on the observer's image plane, we will have significant emission. Okay, so let's go through this a little bit slowly here. So these green photons on the observer's image plane, they would be located outside the edge of the black hole shadow. And so we can trace these photons back in time from the, from the observer's plane. And what we will see is that these photons pass through this region. Now, if you remember one of the bullet points from my previous slide, one of those bullet points said that the emission had to originate close to the black hole. So you can imagine it having the peak of the emission essentially right outside this photon orbit. So these green photons will collect some emission. So there will be some emission at that location on the observer's image plane but it won't be probably the peak. Now for these red photons, um, if you trace them backwards in time all the way, they will fall into the black hole, but there is matter over here um, that can emit light. And some of this light will uh, be able to escape the black hole and reach the, uh, the observer's image plane. And so this location on the observer's image plane will be inside of the edge of the black hole shadow. And it will have some emission, but again, it probably won't be the peak. Now, these black photons are tangent to the photon orbit, and they are also right at the edge of the black hole shadow. And as you can see, due to the lensing, they will probe essentially all uh, or almost all of the region that has the very high emission. Again, when those free bullet points are met, which again, remember that we chose this particular wavelength because we knew that those bullet points would be met for these particular black holes. And so this is why we expect to have a significant emission right at the edge of the black hole shadow. So now that we've talked a lot about the theoretical background that you need to understand this test, I also want to take a few minutes to talk about the actual experiment and specifically the, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope itself, and then how we go from the raw uh, interferometric data to an actual image. So this video is going to take you on a tour of the telescopes that participated in the 2017 observations. And those are the observations that were taken, that were used, sorry, for the, uh, for the image of M87 that we published in 2019. And so we used all of these telescopes spread around the Earth, and they all worked in unison and observed the source at the exact same time, such that they all behave essentially as a single Earth-sized telescope. And what's really exciting is that if we are able to observe in 2021, again, you know, it, it obviously will depend on the, on the pandemic, but if the pandemic allows us to observe in 2021, we hope to be able to add free new telescopes to this array, which will make a really, really huge difference in the, uh, in the images that we can create, which is very exciting. And so I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about how an interferometer works. An interferometer is um, a telescope that is made up of a bunch of other smaller telescopes, which work together to form one really big telescope. And interferometers observe in the Fourier domain. So, we probably have hopefully all learned about uh, the Fourier transform in one dimension, but you can do that in two dimensions as well. And so you, for any image, you can take the Fourier transform of the image and the result will be a two dimensional map where each location in that map will have a complex Fourier component. So this is the map that I'm showing you here. This is Fourier space. Um, the zero baseline will be contained at the very center of the Fourier space here. And as you move farther from the center, you will be increasing your frequency. And for an image, what you should really be thinking about is that low frequency will give you the larger scale structures in your image. So if you want to know um, kind of what the overall structure is, you need to know what's going on in this area of Fourier space. But if you instead want to know more details about your image, you want to get the small scales, or in other words, you want a higher resolution image, you're going to need higher frequency components as well. And so by placing your telescopes on Earth farther apart, the distance between them will determine the distance from the center of the Fourier domain. Also, 
lambda here is your the wavelength that you observe at, and that does uh, that does uh, matter as well. And so each pair of telescopes will observe a very specific location in the Fourier domain, and it will observe the complex Fourier component. So we have both the amplitude and the phase of this complex component. And so what's really exciting and interesting, I think, about our, our, our instrument is that we actually use the rotation of the Earth as part of our instrument. And so as the Earth rotates, each pair of telescopes will be located at a slightly different location relative to the source that we're observing. And so each pair of telescopes will kind of probe a curve in the Fourier domain. And again, you can see that we have other telescopes coming into view so we can create new pairs of telescopes. And again, each pair will observe a specific location. And um, that, you know, that, that took you about a few seconds actually takes about 12 hours on Earth. So it takes us 12 hours to collect the data on the locations that you see here. So already you can tell that there is a lot of empty space, right? There is a lot of locations where we do not have telescopes. We have not been able to cover the entire Earth in telescopes. If we were able to cover the entire Earth in telescopes, we would then just be able to, to perform a inverse Fourier transform using this data to get our image, right? So just perform an inverse Fourier transform or return the image of the source. However, what we are actually doing is that we're trying to do an inverse Fourier transform where we've lost 95% of the data, right? So this is what we call sparse interferometric coverage. Um, and so there are very complicated uh, algorithms that, that perform these calculations and, and use this data to make an image. I'm not going to get into the details of these algorithms, but what I hope to do in the next couple of slides is give you a very simplified example that I hope will build some intuition for how we go from these data to an actual image. So, so first step is we need to look at the data a little bit more closely. So this is the same plot that I just showed you, but now I'm, I am uh, labeling the different curves with the telescopes that they correspond to. And on the right here, I'm showing you the exact same data, but in a slightly different way. So the x-axis here is the frequency. And as we've already learned, the frequency is really just the distance from the center of your Fourier domain here. So for example, these blue points, which are the closest points to the center of the Fourier domain, will be these points right here. Okay. And the y-axis here is going to be the amplitude of your complex Fourier component. In, in VLBI, which is very long baseline interferometry, we call that visibility amplitude. And already you can see that there is this very particular structure here. There's this ringing structure, okay? In this uh, dashed line here, this is the Fourier amplitude of a very thin symmetric ring. And this is really just a Bessel function, okay? So already, just based on this feature, the fact that there is this minimum and then it comes right back up, just based on that, we can already learn a lot about what image is possible with this data. So in astronomy, most objects are spheres. And so what we want to do in this exercise is we want to start with the simplest possible object or simplest possible image, which would just be a filled disk like this. And so what this, uh, animation is going to show you is I'm going to try to change this image to see if I can fit the data. The data on the right here are shown as these red dots. The, this is the real EHT data that was used to actually make the image. And this yellow curve here is the amplitude of the Fourier component of this image. Okay, so we're going to try to change this image to see if it's possible to fit our data with a filled disk. So I can change the size of that. And by changing the size, I am able to fit the beginning of this curve and I'm able to fit the location of this first minimum. But I do a really horrible job with the second peak, right? So already, even with this very simple example, we can already convince ourselves that it's impossible to fit this data with a filled disk. The next uh, step is we're gonna add a little bit more complexity. We're gonna add a flux depression to the center of our filled disk. And by doing that, we can get the height of the second peak pretty close. And this, by the way, is actually very close to the size of the ring that we actually ended up publishing in our image. And so I am over predicting the peak here slightly, but if I blur my image just a little bit, 
um, I do a much better job here. And of course, you're probably noticing that there are these data points here, which we do a terrible job fitting. And that's because this image is too simplified. I have assumed that the image is symmetric and that is not actually the case. And this is what these data points are telling you is that you need an asymmetric image to fit the data. And so, of course, as I already mentioned, the actual algorithms are much more uh, elaborate than that, but I hope that that helps build a little bit of intuition for how very long baseline interferometry works. And so this, of course, is the image that you have all probably seen maybe even hundreds of times by now. And there are a few specific features in this image that we trust and some others that we do not. So specifically, I hope that I've already convinced you that we do trust that there needs to be a flux depression. We do believe that there is in fact a ring and we believe that we can measure the radius of that ring. And we believe that there is a north-south asymmetry. However, the details about the knotty structure that you see here or any of these details over here, I caution you against interpreting those because we are not sure about those features. They might just be artifacts. So the first thing that we can do is check whether the size of this ring is consistent with the predictions for the Kerr metric. And the answer to that is yes. The size of this ring is consistent with our predictions, which is wonderful for general relativity. The second thing we wanna do, which is um, what we did in a paper that came out in October of 2020, is ask ourselves, how restrictive is this new test of graph? It's great that it's consistent with gravity, but have we ruled out anything, right? Are there any black holes that would not be consistent with our data that we would be able to rule out? So to do this, what we need to do is we need to define or calculate a error bar. And that error bar needs to take into account the uncertainty on the mass measurement of this black hole that was done previously by other groups. It needs to take into account the uncertainty of the distance measurement. It needs to take into account the uncertainty due to the fact that we do not know the spin, so that 4% uncertainty. And it needs to take into account what I consider the theoretical uncertainty, which comes from the fact that when we measure the radius of this ring, we are using the peak of the emission as a proxy for the measurement of the black hole shadow. So there is an inherent uncertainty in that measurement. And so taking all of that into account, the, uns the uncertainty that we have is about 17%, which looks kind of like this. And so using this 17%, we can see whether we would be able to rule out any black holes. So specifically what I have been doing is I have been treating black holes as pure geometry as I already discussed at the beginning. And what I'm doing is I start with the Kerr metric, again, just the, a geometric object, and I add different perturbations to that geometry. And this is done in a parametric form such that there are several different free parameters. And I can change these free parameters and it will change the relative amplitude of different perturbations. Okay, so there are several different perturbative parameterized metrics that have been developed over the years. And I am trying to probe as much of the allowed parameter space for as many of these metrics as possible. And so far I've simulated over 25,000 different black holes. And so what you're seeing here is just a couple examples of that. In each of these two panels, I'm only varying one specific parameter in one specific metric. But already you can see that I can change the size of the black hole shadow significantly, and I can change the shape of the black hole shadow significantly. If you would like to play around with this, I do have an interactive plot on my website where you can change these parameters and see what kind of weirdly shaped black hole shadows you can create. And so what we did in this paper in 2020 was um, try to use these simulations to see if we can place uh, some constraints on these different perturbation parameters. And so we were able to do that. This is a, a, a plot from the October paper of 2020. And what we were able to do was place these constraints and then also show how these constraints would vary as a function of black hole spin, right? So in each of these panels, I'm showing a, a different parameterized metric. And in each of these panels, I am showing you the constraints that we can place on the parameter that has the largest possible effect on the size of the black hole shadow. And I'm also showing you in these different uh, colored lines and different symbols, the effect of changing the second parameter that has the second most important effect on the size, okay? And so this was already very exciting that we were able to place these constraints on these perturbation parameters. 
But what you're probably wondering is why you should care, right? So most people have not heard about these parameterized metrics, definitely haven't heard about these particular parameters. So how can we place these constraints in the context of the larger testing gravity community? And so specifically what we were able to do was we were able to connect these constraints on these parameters to what's called the parametric post-Newtonian formalism. And this is just another way to para parametrize deviations in gravity. And that formalism, which for short, we call it PPN, that formalism is used a lot in solar system tests. And so what we were able to do by connecting this is first, we were able to show that what we are actually constraining is the GTT component of the metric. So that's the time time component. And um, that in general uh, can control, for example, the slowing down of clocks. And that's also the component of the metric that is tested when you're using, for example, the precession of Mercury's orbit around the sun. And so we know exactly what part of the metric that we are constraining. And we were also able to show that the constraints that we have placed on these parameters are, um, are equivalent to constraints at the second post-Newtonian order, which is very exciting because that is very, very hard to do in the solar system, for example. And so specifically, we were able to compare to what was done with Mercury's orbit. And we were able to show that our constraints are about 500 times more restrictive than what can be done in the solar system. And the second thing we were able to do was also compare to what can be done with gravitational waves, specifically LIGO and Virgo. And so this is uh, another paper that, that just got submitted, um, which compares the constraints from these two experiments. So specifically, this plot is showing you the correlated constraints that we can place on the 1pn and the 2pn components. Okay, so this is the first order and the second order parameters for this PPN formalism. And so each of these experiments, both the EHT experiment and the gravitational wave experiment, do their actual experiments in, in very different formalisms, but we were both able to connect to each other using PPN. And what was surprising and a little bit unfortunate is that uh, the constraints between these two parameters are correlated for both experiments, which we definitely expected. What we did not expect is that these constraints are all um, essentially very, very similar to each other. They're all almost perfectly aligned with each other. So that is a little bit unfortunate. So we can't use them to, to further constrain each, uh, each other. But what is hopeful is that if we can observe a gravitational wave event of a much smaller mass black holes, then the correlation would lie along this uh, red line that you see here. And in that case, we would be able to use that uh, event to constrain this further. And so that is uh, exciting for the future. And so um, I will uh, let, uh, let Professor Miller decide um, if she would like me to uh, end here because we are 15 minutes past the hour and I do want to allow for enough time for questions. Or what I can talk about is either my, um, my career trajectory for a, a couple more minutes or I can also talk about how we plan to improve upon this in the future. So I will leave that, that up to you. Oh man, all of those things sound like good options. Um... I think, I mean, I know students always love to hear about your career trajectory. So if you want to spend a couple minutes talking about that, that'd be great, I think. Although okay, I don't want to say all of the above, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know if we had enough time, right? Um, okay, so, so there's a very specific part of my trajectory that I always like to share with students because I wish that somebody had shared something similar uh, to, to this experience with me when I was a student. So when I was applying to graduate school, I really wanted to use astrophysical black holes to test fundamental physics. But at the time, this was you know several years ago, at the time, this was not something that humans had actually been able to do yet because gravitational waves had not been, been uh, detected and the EHT had not really existed yet. So it was um, very stressful for me at the time as I was applying to graduate school because I was worried that the thing that I was really interested in just didn't really exist. And so I made a decision on what grad school to go to based on, you know, not complete information, of course, and 
I was very, very worried as I was applying and as I was making this decision, my biggest worry was that I wasn't going to find a professor that was interested in working with me where I wasn't going to find a project that was close enough to my interests. And essentially all of my fears came true, which I know is not inspirational at all, but hold on because it gets better, I promise. Um, so all of my fears came true and I was at the end of my second year uh, as a graduate student and I had not found an advisor and I had not done any research in graduate school and I did not have really a whole lot of hope to find any research that would be similar to what I wanted. And what happened was that a professor came from a different university to give a colloquium. And I was really interested in her research and it was very similar to what I had originally wanted to do. And so I talked to her about this and she was very nice about it and essentially just said, great, come, come work with me. Um, obviously it was a little bit more complicated than that. Um, it required a lot of meetings and a lot of kind of uh, bending some rules, but, but it all worked out. And, and um, by the end, I was really, really happy with the project that I had worked on. And as you probably learned through, um, through this talk, I did end up doing exactly what it was that I wanted to do when I started out, which is not to say that you, you know, have to do what you originally wanted to do. There's many people that realize they're actually more excited about something else. But to me, at least, it would have been great to hear about a story where pretty much everything that could have gone wrong went wrong and it still ended up just fine. And your trajectory doesn't have to be a clean straight line as, uh, as it's usually portrayed. Um, you can change your mind. You can, you know, I ended up spending time at three different universities during my PhD and did not do, did not write a single paper with a single person at the university where I got my PhD. And my advisor and I had to fly into that university for my, my PhD defense and nobody on my committee other than my advisor that was the external, uh, <laughs> external person, nobody else really knew what I had been doing other than you know, seeing published papers. Um, so anyway, so I hope that that gives you a little bit of comfort as you apply to grad school or as you make decisions on where you wanna go that um, that when you make the decision of where you want to go, it does not it, it does not completely determine your fate. There is still some wiggle room. There are ways to to bend the rules and make things work in kind of unorthodox uh, ways. So I hope I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I know we have at least one student in the audience who will be starting a PhD program next year. So I'm sure Wonderful. they'll appreciate they appreciate hearing that. Um, so great. So with that, um, we can open it up to questions um, about the talk or I'm sure about the trajectory or and um, you can just type your question in the chat uh, or you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself and, and ask away. I cannot see the chat. So if there are questions in the chat, please read them to me. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. I have a question, actually. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that the Kerr solution is the only solution that's astrophysical that we would observe. And I was just wondering if you could give a short explanation as to why we wouldn't see something like the Schwarzschild metric, why it's guaranteed that black holes will have spin. Sorry, that's actually a really important uh, point that I should have mentioned. Um, I include Schwarzschild as part of Kerr because it's just Kerr with spin. So. Okay. So okay. I am not ruling out Schwarzschild. Um, we have not measured a non-spinning black hole, but any spin measurement has such a ridiculously large uncertainty that it is certainly not ruled out. Um, and there are, are people that do argue that, that they expect low spin black holes in particular cases, yeah. The main thing I'm trying to, to say is that we don't expect charge. Great, thank you, Andrew. So we do actually have a question in the chat. So Alex asks, so he didn't quite catch. Um, could you explain again the difference between the metric test and a dynamical test? Yes, yes, of course. So the difference just mostly has to do with um, what we're sensitive to. Okay, so in our case, our black hole is essentially in vacuum and it's not doing anything. It's just kind of sitting over there in vacuum not really interacting with any significant mass. It has matter falling into it, but that matter is just so, so small relative to the mass of the black hole that it's not going to affect the space time at all. And so that is 
Um, when we are performing tests with a black hole that is just kind of sitting in vacuum, um, the things that we can test are the metric of the black hole, because that's the only thing that's happening. However, with the example of gravitational waves, what we have in that case is that we have, for example, two black holes going around each other. And so that system inherently has to take into account how the metrics will change as a function of time. So you need to be sensitive to the dynamical aspects of the theory, right? Because the dynamical aspect of the theory is what's going to predict how these two black holes will spiral around each other. So by testing how they are spiraling, you are um, essentially testing the dynamical aspect, right? And so, um, so it's not that the gravitational waves are not affected by the metric, it's that the gravitational waves have to take into account both the metric and the dyna dynamical aspect, whereas these, uh, whereas what we do with these supermassive black holes, um, we're, we're just not affected by the dynamics at all. And so we don't care about the dynamics. It doesn't affect what we're doing. The only thing we do care about is that we assume that photons will still follow geodesics through these weird geometries. Um, and that's really the only, the only thing we need from, from the rest of the theory. Did that answer your question? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Um, it's hard to not be, when I can't see people, it's hard to tell. If, he says thank you in the chat, so I think oh, it's okay. um, great. So, are there any other questions? Yeah, I have one last question. Actually, um, did you mention at any point what the mass of the black hole that the image was uh, oh, taken of? I did not. I actually had that slide, and due to time, I it was the last slide I cut. <laughs> And so the mass of this black hole, uh, as measured by the Event Horizon Telescope, is 6.5 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. So it's 6.5 billion solar masses. The other black hole that we are observing is about a thousand times smaller. It's 4.3 million times the mass of the sun, but it's also about a thousand times closer to us. And so we expect that both of these black holes will have an image size that is similar from our point of view because the two factors of a thousand count cancel out almost perfectly. Um, but yeah, no, that's a really good point. It's a, it's a very, very large black hole. Um, and it was a whole other part of this experiment is the fact that there were two mass measurements before the EHT that were contradictory by a, about a factor of two. And so this was the case, not just for this black hole, but for several black holes. And so for many years, there's been these two mass measurements and there's been this controversy between the fact that you know there is this discrepancy between them, and so having a third measurement um, was really helpful because it was very clear that our measurement with the EHT preferred a particular mass. And so, so I want to be very clear here. So, so the EHT does several things in several different papers, and in one paper we assume that it's Kerr, and if it's Kerr, we then measure the mass. And in a different paper. We do not assume that it's Kerr, and we use a previous mass measurement to then test for potential deviations um, for from the Kerr Kerr solution. Interesting. Thank you. Great, and we're pretty much at time, but there was one more question in the chat. If you don't mind giving us a couple, oh, and one more minute. All right. So Veronica ask, asks, "What's the process um, to adding more telescopes?" You mentioned good that. question. Very good question. Okay, so we are observing at 1.3 millimeters, which is in the radio regime, but it's a pretty short radio wavelength. And so there are a few things that are specifically required for this kind of uh, telescope. So first, the water vapor in the atmosphere really affects our measurements, so it needs to be high enough, right? So you need a telescope that's essentially on a really big mountain, and there's only so many really big mountains on Earth, and we've We've got almost all of them. Um, there are people that are really seriously considering trying to put one on top of Kilimanjaro. I don't know whether or not that will happen, but my point is just we need these high mountains to be able to, um, to use these telescopes. The second thing you need um, is you need to have a receiver that is specifically made for the LBI. And that is what the EHT has done, right? So all these telescopes already existed. We didn't build any telescopes ourselves. They existed for other, other uh, projects, right? So for example, the telescope at the South Pole, that's for uh, cosmology, it's for CMB detection. 
Um, and so it operates for you know the rest of the year doing this other project, but then for five days um, in 2017 and in 2018, we were able to use it. And for those five days, we just switched out the receiver, which is the part that actually collects the light, right? So the, the dish kind of funnels all of the radio waves into a specific kind of beam. And then your receiver is what collects that information. And so VLBI receivers are very different because what we need is we actually need to collect all of the information from each and every wave that reaches our telescopes. So this is a part of the, of the experiment that I also had a slide for and I also removed due to time. And so each wave that comes into each telescope, we, we have to measure the exact time that that wave arrived. And so not only we need a fancy receiver, we also need to have an atomic clock because that's the precision that we need for our time measurement. So it's literally a, a maser that we use as our clock. And then we need to collect all of the information from each and every wavefront, which amounts to about five petabytes of data, which literally is like, you know, we need to put thousands of hard disks into crates and ship them, which again, getting that out of the South Pole took several months because we had to wait until the next summer to be able to actually fly a plane out of the South Pole to bring that data back. And so all of these things need to be uh, done for you to be able to add a telescope to the array. But, um, but from a instrumentation and engineering point of view, it's a really, really exciting uh, feat. This is the shortest wavelength we've ever been able to uh, use for an interferometer. Um, and that's really important because it's really, really hard because the shorter the wavelength, the more precise you need, for example, your clock to be. Right, so because we have such a short wavelength, we need this ridiculously precise clock, right? And so um, it was really, really uh, exciting for for a lot of um, a lot of you know theoretical physics reasons, but also for a lot of engineering reasons as well. Sorry, that was very long winded, but I hope that was helpful. <laughs> no, thank you. It was great. It was great. Um, so uh, we're over time now, so I guess we'll stop there. But um, thank you so much. So I guess I'll clap on behalf of the whole audience in this Zoom format. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Medeiros. That was excellent. Um, I really appreciated that talk. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so next week, we'll have Dr. Cora Fujiwara, who will be telling us about her work um, with ultra cold atoms, where you can actually, it's so cold, you can do quantum simulation. So it should be another really, really fun talk. So thank you again so much, Dr. Medeiros, and thank you everyone.